Hello, and welcome to Arizona Cat's Eye, a new show produced by the students at the University of Arizona School of Journalism. I'm Ireland Stevenson. And I'm Adrian Ford. Today we start with health. Smoking is known to be hazardous, and now the city of Tucson is taking action to stop young people from having access to cigarettes and vaping products. Last October, the city of Tucson passed what's known as T21 legislation, raising the age to purchase both tobacco and vaping products to 21. Pima County School Superintendent Dustin Williams says the goal is to stop young people from having easy access to these products. We have kids purchasing these not one pack at a time. They're purchasing 10, 12 packs at a time, and they go into a school and sell them for twice the amount that they bought them for. And they have made their way into middle schools, and we have even heard of some cases where they've been in an elementary. The legislation only affects the city. Pima County will continue selling tobacco products to people 18 or older. Teachers and parents are concerned for their children's health as vaping-related illnesses continue to rise. Thousands have become ill nationwide, and almost 40 deaths have been attributed to vaping. Arizona Cat's Eye reporter Cole Anderson has more. Researchers have not yet pinned down how vaping is causing these health problems, but they know the number is growing. As of December 4th, 2,300 cases of vaping-related illnesses have been reported. 17 of those have been in Arizona. Health officials are recommending just to put down those vaping devices. Federal health agencies, such as the Centers for Disease Control and Food and Drug Administration, are partnering with states to figure out why people have been getting so sick. Chronic exposure. Dr. Scott Boitano, a researcher in the Asthma and Disease Department at the University of Arizona, says health officials haven't yet pinpointed why. And we really don't know what we're looking at with e-cigarettes. And one of the biggest problems is that we're really at this point still looking at more or less acute effects. And we don't know what the chronic problems are because the product has not been on the market for more than 10 years at this point. The Truth Initiative, America's biggest nonprofit organization dedicated to stop tobacco usage, revealed that 15 to 17 year olds are 16 times more likely to be current Juul users compared to those aged 25 to 34. Here in Arizona, the smoking age is 18, so a lot of people in high school were smoking um, around senior year, and that's when Juul's kind of blew up was my senior year in high school. The FDA reports that school, health, and other government officials have been struggling to turn teens away from vaping products. That's been difficult since e-cigarette companies report that vaping products are safer than regular cigarettes. Another thing that the e-cigarette companies did early on was to use a lot of flavorants to expand the population of who was allowed, who might be interested in using e-cigarettes. Um, this actually was quite effective in certainly getting a younger population involved. Researchers and medical professionals are warning people to stop using their vaping products until they figure out the cause of the many illnesses and deaths. For Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Cole Anderson. A new study from Healthy Babies and Bright Futures found that 95% of baby foods tested contain traces of metals such as cadmium, arsenic, lead, and mercury, which can alter the developing brain and erode IQ and influence behavior. Gabrielle Hawks suggests a potential solution called baby lead weaning. Baby lead weaning is basically not using baby food and you're going from milk or breast milk or formula to food. So you're skipping all the purees and you're basically giving babies small like mushy food like squash or oatmeal. In addition, 33,000 bottles of baby powder by Johnson & Johnson have been recalled after the Food and Drug Administration discovered evidence of a known carcinogen. 95% of college counseling directors agree that mental illnesses are a growing concern on campus. Universities are taking steps to address these rising numbers. Mental health problems can take many forms. Depression, anxiety, eating disorders, addiction. The University of Arizona is helping students with its Thrive Center. The Thrive Center is a part of the Student Success and Retention Innovation Unit, which supports the success of all undergraduate students at the University of Arizona. Senior Coordinator Chris Oka says that their goal is in the center's name, to help students thrive. LFA Cat Lounge is the newest Tucson hangout 
for anyone looking to relax. The Cat Lounge, which opened on Halloween, is home to 19 cats. Co-owner Tiffany Lee says it is a great place for students because it provides stress relief while also being beneficial to their health. Lee says that petting cats has been scientifically proven to lower your blood pressure and the purring also calms you. All cats at El Jefe are available for adoption and the cats at the lounge are better suited for adoption than most shelter cats because they have an opportunity to socialize and aren't in cages. Tucson celebrated its 42nd annual Pride Festival this September. Tucson is rich in LGBTQ plus history and offers many resources for both residents and UA students. The Tucson Lesbian and Gay Alliance, also known as Tucson Pride, began in 1976 after a hate crime that resulted in the death of a member of the LGBTQ plus community. Tucson Pride is an all-volunteer nonprofit that hosts cultural, educational, and recreational events. Tucson Pride has been growing over the years. UA professor Adam Geary says that while Tucson is making strides with Tucson Pride, there is still a long way to go. The number of places where people can express themselves in Tucson is relatively small and has gotten smaller over the years that I've been here. Um, for instance, there used to be a separate community center um, which folded four or five years ago. Um, a number of those services have been incorporated into the Southern Arizona AIDS Foundation, but there was also a loss in the community center. Um, for instance, and for instance, the number of bars has shrunk in the years that I've been here. When we come back, what's new with e-scooters around Tucson and what's being done to keep pedestrians safe? We'll be right back. The University of Arizona School of Journalism is adamant about showing students real life examples of what it means to be a journalist. The school brings in alumni and individuals who have worked in the field two to three times a month and once a week for graduate students. In November, Perla Trevizo, an award-winning Mexican-American journalist, visited the U of A. She has more than a decade's worth of experience covering immigration stories from about a dozen countries. Trevizo spoke about the lives, journeys, and hardships of those that make their way across borders. Trevizo is a former Arizona Daily Star reporter and now works as an environmental writer for the Houston Chronicle. She is currently on tour sponsored by the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting to discuss migration at universities and in order to inspire young journalists. Welcome back. A new and easy way to get around Tucson. Arizona Cat's Eye reporter Jack Cooper is in the studio with more. Jack? Thanks, Adrian. E-scooters have officially hit the streets in Tucson, joining more than 100 different cities worldwide. On Thursday, September 12th, the e-scooter companies Bird and Razor debuted electronic scooters around Tucson. Anyone can go from walking to scootering in a few simple steps. Users download the app of one of the scooter companies to a smartphone. Then they can scan a QR code to unlock the scooter. The price is determined by the amount of time the scooter is used and how far someone travels. There are some safety concerns with the scooters, however. They can travel up to 15 miles per hour, but helmets are not required by law. Jacob Toth works for Razor and talks about what he does for the e-scooter company. And basically what I do is I go around, I swap out the batteries. If they're low, I'll take the scooters back if there's any damage to them, and I'll move them around if they're like all scattered. The scooters are a quick way for people to get from place to place if they don't have a car or any other way to get around the city. While Tucson is still getting used to the new e-scooters, there's one main part of Tucson that's missing out. The University of Arizona is what is called a dead zone for the scooters. There is a GPS chip in each that shows where they are and if they cross onto the campus, they will not work. UA students have mixed feelings about whether they should be allowed on campus. No. They can be around U of A, but not in the campus. And why not in the campus? Well, basically because people get run over by bikes, so they'll probably get run over by the scooters as well. Electric skateboards I see all the time, and I don't see a real huge difference between a bird like a scooter and a skateboard. So yeah, I think they should be allowed. The scooters are still in a testing phase in Tucson, which means for the next couple of months, city officials will be watching them carefully. Depending on how the trial phase goes, Tucsonans could see a rise of the scooters in the near future. With the trial period ending in December, the city council will vote on whether or not to keep the scooters. Reporting for Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Jack Cooper. 
The city of Tucson is adding new bicycle boulevards as a part of the voter approved Proposition 407. The boulevards are designed to enhance connectivity and overall safety. By 2020, Tucson's new project will expand bicycle boulevards by seven miles in Tucson's south side. New project locations include Michigan and Fair Street, Greenway Drive and Cherry Avenue. Project manager for the Tucson Department of Transportation, Ryan Fagan, oversees the new bicycle boulevards. When, when you don't create those opportunities for conflicts naturally, then you're not going to have as many um, collisions. And so um, that, that's really you know, safety and, and comfort for people who aren't necessarily comfortable with riding on, on major streets. Those are the reasons why we're, why we're building the, these. TDOT plans to add safety features alongside bike boulevards, including reduced speed limits and flashing pedestrian crosswalks. They are asking for your input on the new bicycle boulevards, which you can post on TucsonAZ.gov. Tucson Cyclovia kicked off this fall, bringing bicyclists and pedestrians from around town to imagine and experience their streets in a different way. Cyclovia is hosted twice a year by the Living Streets Alliance a nonprofit organization focused on making Tucson streets thrive. This car-free, open to the public event stretches three and a half miles along Tucson's south side. Everything from street performers, arts and crafts, food trucks, and more can be found at the event. I think people from the east side get to see stuff from the south side. They've had it on the east side and the north side before, so it gets community together. And then having booths from all different kinds of places lets you uh, see what's going on around town. Cyclovia provides an opportunity for Tucson residents to engage in physical activity as well as promoting cycling and walking. The location for Cyclovia rotates every two years. News and updates on the location can be found at cycloviatucson.org. Next, we look at a new type of dog shelter. And a new app you can use to stay safe on campus. Every semester, the journalism school puts on an event called Pizza and Portfolios. Renee Schaefer Horton sets up the event where students can bring resumes, reels, cover letters, and whatever else they have to get looked at by professors from the School of Journalism. There's also a panel of current and former students who talk about how they got jobs or internships during college. There is free food and drinks, and anyone in the School of Journalism is welcome to attend. Tucson celebrated its 30th annual All Souls procession downtown. The theme was the realm of the unseen, an exploration of isolation and connection, consumerism and culture. With tens of thousands of people attending this event, organizers expect to see more community participation in the future. We just love the Day of the Dead Festival and remembering people that have passed and all the just awesome things that go on. It's, it's super cool. We've lived in a lot of cities, never anything quite like this anywhere in the country. In search for their newest assistant, the Africana Studies Program at the UA stumbled upon a remarkable candidate, one who would create a progressive difference in its community. This newest employee, named Temi, is the U of A's first truly intelligent, mobile, personal robot and places people at the center of its own technological world. Director of TechCore, Ash Black, says Temi has a unique way of interacting with people. But I think what's really different about Temi is that Temi is like this anthropomorphic little kid, you know what I mean? And um, the remarkable thing about it is that you, you just move him, move him around and have him sort of work with people in um, the public space downstairs. And it's pr pretty unanimous that people react to it like it's a pet or it's a person. And, and I think that that's pretty remarkable. It's not seen as a piece of hardware. Uh, it's seen as a, like, what's that? You know. TechCore has been integrating Temi for several months. And although they do not have an expected finish date, they are beginning to see the effects it has on students and faculty. The program says Temi boosts people's moods when they see it roaming around. Temi is also beginning the process of making friends and becoming familiar with its new environment. September 11th is a day that Americans should never forget. In this past September, thousands of Arizonans did their part by taking the 9-11 Tower Challenge. The challenge was held at Arizona Stadium and the concept is simple. Walk up 2,071 steps. 
the same amount first responders climbed in the Twin Towers in 2001. Honoring the victims and first responders is a big reason people compete in the challenge. But for the event's keynote speaker, retired Army Staff Sergeant Bobby Henline, it's more personal. Henline climbed the steps to remember those he lost while serving. And in my last tour, I was hit by a roadside bomb and I lost four buddies in a Humvee. I was the sole survivor. So today I'm going to be running this challenge for their names. Henline says that a person is never gone until they're forgotten. And that's why it's important to compete in the challenge, to keep the memory of his fallen comrades alive. A new social media app used to promote safety is growing in popularity amongst students. Wildfire, which is based on geographical location, allows users to alert other community members when there is an emergency or safety-related incident. Although many students use the app, the postings are not always accurate. The app is not affiliated with the school or the University of Arizona Police Department. UAPD recommends that in an emergency situation, contact the police first. Dogs on couches and not a kennel in sight. Lon Cantata's new dog adoption center is a bit out of the ordinary. Arizona Cat's Eye reporter Olivia Ledford has the story. Tucson Rescue Now is a new dog adoption center opening at La Encantada Shopping Mall. But this is not a traditional animal shelter. The biggest difference is people hoping to adopt get to meet the dogs while they lounge on couches instead of seeing them in kennels. Co-founder John Gilbert says this relaxed situation can be beneficial in the adoption process. Being out of that atmosphere and being out of caging and kennels and stuff, the dog's personalities changed. Along with an intimate adoption process, Tucson Rescue Now has a special focus, dogs that tug at their heartstrings, which are senior dogs. Older dogs often get overlooked in the adoption process because most people think a puppy is the ideal first pet. But older dogs can fit into many lifestyles and even benefit your health. Senior dogs are the focus of Tucson Rescue Now because co-founders John and Jace both know how special they are. Co-founder Jace Powers says that adopting a senior dog is a rewarding experience. It's just a different view of, of, of life, I guess, with uh, an older animal. It just makes you slow down a little bit and understand it, and you, you know that you're doing really well by giving that dog his ending years, uh, wonderful years. Although older dogs are their priority, John and Jace realize that older dogs might not be what everyone wants. They are still able to help everyone through what what they call a Match.com for dogs and their potential owners. The center is able to help customers find the dog breed they want through resources like Pet Harbor. John says they will still be able to help each family find their forever friend. We're going to offer that service that we'll find a dog for them and bring it over here and they can see it in a really nice relaxed atmosphere um, sitting on the couch with a dog. Tucson Rescue Now is set to open on October 11th. The opening of the center, John and Jace hope their different setup and process will bring fresh awareness towards the adoption of shelter dogs, rescue dogs, and especially senior dogs. For Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Olivia Ledford. Imagine starting your own petting zoo off of an impulse buy online. A Tucsonan did just that, plus a little extra. This is Georgie McNeil, the owner and operator of Funny Foot Farm and the Tucson Petting Zoo. Like a regular petting zoo, there are your typical farm animals, but Funny Foot Farm specializes in the exotic. Interact with animals like porcupines, emus, Patagonian maras, and even kangaroos. Georgie opened the farm because there aren't enough places for kids and adults to see or learn about exotic animals. More than anything, I love the educational factor of this. We get to get to see kids of all ages, from, from young to our adults, that get to learn something new here. It's all about teaching kids about it, teaching adults about stuff. Georgie was not only determined to have exotic animals in her petting zoo, but to also yeah. teach people about these animals and why they're so special. Right after this brief break, construction at the main library. And vandalism at the Islamic Center. Stay with us. The Pima Animal Care Center has seen a sharp rise in the number of animals in October the last couple years. The pack can house about 500 animals, but the month of October usually stretches them to their limits. 
This October, 400 animals came in during the first week alone. But even with the increase, the staff has an upbeat attitude about caring for the animals. Director of Operations Michelle Figueroa explains. Every day we come to work for the goal of getting as many as we can out and that while they are in our care that we are giving them everything they need. Changes to historic 4th Avenue are underway as new Skyrise apartment complexes are under construction. Executive Director for the 4th Avenue Merchants Association, Fred Ronstadt, says it's part of the evolution of downtown Tucson and that the project should be completed in the next two to three years. But some shop owners like Emmanuel Arnautovich say the apartments are an example of the university muscling their way into the avenue. Residents of the Luna apartment complex were recently involved in an incident with the Islamic Center of Tucson. Residents allegedly threw objects at the Islamic Center members and yelled racial slurs towards them, potentially making this a hate crime. An email was sent on August 29th to Luna residents and backers from GMH Capital Partners, the company that owns Sol E. Luna Apartments. GMH says that the company reserves the right to secure balcony doors to prevent balcony access. Part of the University of Arizona Student Success District is renovating the entire library. UA is undergoing a complete renovation of its libraries to connect them and include the Bear Down Gym in their new Student Success District. Construction goes from Monday to Friday, but ends at 4 p.m., and there isn't any on weekends. But with finals coming up, some students aren't happy about the timing of the construction. The library assures students that they are still operational and will offer noise-reducing earplugs to help with the construction noise. As levels of food insecurity rise on college campuses, programs like the University of Arizona's Campus Pantry help provide a reliable source of groceries for students and faculty. Arizona Cat's Eye reporter Javon Gray introduces us to one student who is helping to provide more meals to the UA community. Michaela Davenport is a senior at the University of Arizona and is the current student director for UA's Campus Pantry. Davenport grew up in Tucson, Arizona with two social worker parents and knew that she wanted to create a difference in college after acting as a facilitator for a domestic poverty group in high school. Michaela became passionate about the horrible conditions of poverty and knew that she needed to do something to help her fellow peers. This passion was really like came out of me and I was really, really frustrated with the inequities around me and growing up in Tucson, like food insecurity is a huge issue here. And so I realized just how big of an issue it was. And so I came into college knowing that I wanted to do work around food insecurity. So I got involved in ASUA um, and pretty quickly I found out, found out about this program called Campus Pantry. So in the spring of my freshman year, I applied to work for them in the fall of my sophomore year, I got the job as outreach chair and so it began. While Michaela maintains a reputable role in UA Campus Pantry, she is also involved in many more organizations. ASUA co-worker and close friend of Davenport, Kate Rosenstengel, speaks of all of the organizations that Michaela puts her heart into and the ways in which she manages to do it all. All of our friends seeing her succeed in this way, I think makes us want to do better, seeing her run the campus pantry and be a full-time student that's doing really well and still make time for her friends, um, which she does. She's always, like, if I'm having a bad day, she picks on it, up on it before anybody else and is there for me. Um, so to see her being able to do all of that so just flawlessly, I think, inspires us all to do better in our own lives. Davenport's colleagues and employers are also amazed at the work she does and say that she's the driving force at making Campus Pantry and ASUA a better place. Campus Pantry Coordinator and Head Supervisor Bridget Newby speaks on her hopes for Davenport's future. I think in talking to her, she doesn't know exactly maybe what she wants to do yet. Um, I know she found a great fellowship that she was interested in doing, so absolutely anything that she needs help with for that, I'd love to refer that to her and just he see her improve and um, grow and learn more about poverty and how food insecurity is affecting college students. While Michaela is doing her best to make the University of Arizona a better place, she says there is definitely room for advancements. 
in order to really solve food insecurity, we're gonna have to start looking at it from a much more systemic level and thinking about like, what are we gonna do to support students once they, once they get here, right? Because right now we're operating on the like tacit assumption that just because students attend the University of Arizona, means that they can afford to stay here, which is so, so, so not the case. In the rest of her time at UA, Michaela is hoping to continue her work with Campus Pantry, ASUA, and the honorary community. Until then, Michaela hopes for a day that food insecurity will not be an issue on college campuses and hopes that more students will begin to be involved in that plan. For Arizona Cat's Eye, I'm Javon Gray. The position for UA's Campus Pantry student director opens next semester. If you would like to apply or sign up to volunteer, please visit campuspantry.arizona.edu. This has been the latest edition of Arizona Cat's Eye, a new show produced by the students at the University of Arizona School of Journalism. I'm Adrian Ford. And I'm Ireland Stevenson. Thank you for watching.